Wir machen weiter mit Theresia Reinhold. Äh, ist da? Ja, perfekt. Äh, Theresia ist Historikerin, Journalistin und Filmemacherin, Kurzfilmerin, Dokumentarfilmerin und ähm, ist hier und stellt ihr neues Projekt vor, in dem es um... Das erzählt sie am besten gleich selber, ich könnte es jetzt auch noch... Aber kurze Information für dich, ich glaube, du warst, als wir hier am Anfang mit der Technik so ein bisschen rumgespielt haben, noch nicht drin. Das Video ist jetzt gerade nicht eingebunden in deine Präsentation, es sind nur PDFs, wir switchen gleich um. Nicht, dass du dich wunderst, äh, Leo springt dann an den Laptop, wenn du ihm das Zeichen gibst, dass du das Video sehen willst und dann macht er das an. Herzlich willkommen, vielen Dank, dass du hier bist. Um, hello, cool, I don't have to give you an introduction myself. And um, just a quick side note, uh, even though I'm German, I'm doing this uh, talk in English to reach hopefully a broader audience uh, online afterwards. But if someone has problems understanding English, I'm around afterwards and online anyhow, so you can talk to me. Um, yes. So, information, what are they looking at, is the working title of my current documentary film project. Um, I say working title because it got a lot of criticism from some friends of mine, so in case you have a better idea, please tell me. Uh, because titles are actually really difficult. And, sorry, if you have any thoughts during the presentation, you can either talk to me later or write, um, read right at me at pandemonium21. And now let's get started for real. So, privacy is a human right. I would assume that everybody here in this room and watching this video is very aware of that. And technically, of course, human rights should not be negotiable under any circumstances. Unfortunately, as we are aware as well, this is not actually the case in daily life for a lot of people. But at the same time, not everybody is aware of the fact that privacy is actually a human right that is written down and should not be violated under any circumstances. And the reasons for those are manifold. And by now we have so many amazing resources by so many organizations and journalists and private people who make films or videos, animations, um, exhibitions, um, games even and theater plays on the issues of privacy and surveillance. But still we are only reaching a rather small audience. Um, with this film there will be another resource that tries to tackle um, this kind of well, imbalance that is globally existing. And as some of you might think, I um, have a, had a very interesting encounter with a producer a couple of months ago at a documentary festival who told me, we do not need another movie on privacy and surveillance, we know all about that. And by that time I didn't really have the guts to stand up and say, mate, no we don't. You might know a lot about it, I might know a lot about it, most people here might know shitloads about it, seriously. But most people on this planet don't, because they don't have enough time on their hands to read all of those books and articles that are out there, or just have more pressing issues that are dominating their lives. So, I'm, because at the moment it's just me basically, I'm trying to tackle this um, with this documentary that is supposed to be very attractive to people who have no prior knowledge on this issue whatsoever. And also by staying, I'm trying to do this by staying very close to their daily lives and experiences. And the first part of that, or the first principle I'm building from upon, is the principle of the fact that the narrator is as important as the narrative. So it plays a huge role and has a massive impact on who is on stage, or who is being interviewed, and who is talking to which kind of audience. Which is why, um, I'm selecting my interviews very carefully and trying to get people from very different and huge um, a diversity of backgrounds, both professionally as well as personally. And all those people are especially good in explaining stuff that might seem very basic to everybody here at the moment. So I'm talking to them about issues like what exactly is data and how would you actually explain it to people who don't know anything about this issue whatsoever. 
who basically just use Facebook and might browse the internet for some health advice or watching the news or something like that. And so far I have interviewed those people. Um, some of them you might know, uh, like Julian York of course, who is working for the EFF. Some of them might be a little less well known in this community, like Aditi Gupta or Michi Chudari, who is a technology lawyer. And all of those people have been extremely helpful in trying to explain over very long periods of time and rather long interviews, very basic issues. And currently I am, together with a couple of organizations I'm in um, conversations with, trying to find out which issues should be explained in detail and which we can just skip because they are already going far, uh, too far. And this film is not only supposed to be a 52-minute documentary, which is the standard uh, TV broadcasting then, but it's also a part of a broader, inclusive and accessible media project. Um, with inclusive, I mean we are building, or I am building together with other people, hopefully at some point, um, an inclusive website accompanied by an app, which will be not only accessible and highly usable for a vast majority of a vast audience, but also beautiful, because why should things that are accessible and inclusive not be beautiful at the same time? And on this website and in this app, there will be not only the film hosted as a video, or, and there will also, be, will also be cut down into several chapters of two to three minutes of length, which people can watch as single chapters, but it also makes sense contextualizing a broader movie. So people can actually decide what they want to watch today, or if they are interested in some topics, but not, not so much in others. But it will not only host the videos, we want also to provide those informations as audios, audio files only for people with lower bandwidth, or who just prefer to listen to podcasts, and as transcripts for people with maybe even lower bandwidth, or people who simply cannot download video at that given time for whatever reason. Um, but the main core of it, which is actually the most expensive part, um, will be the translations. The aim is to translate this movie and all the um, single chapters into at least 20 languages. And I'm talking especially about languages in which this information are not yet available. Of course it has to be found out as a community uh, which languages this might be, but it, it's very obvious that of course English is probably the language in which everything is available, whereas Hindi might not be. Um, and those languages, as I said before, shall be built upon, uh, those translations shall be built upon the principles of inclusion. That means they will be available as closed captions, in subtitles, voiceovers, um, in easy to read versions, in sign language, and in braille. Um, this sounds like a lot, <laughs> um, which is probably why a lot of producers were rather taken aback when I talked to them, but I'm quite sure that especially in the times of crowdfunding and communities working together, um, we can actually make this happen. And I want to sh show you a short teaser that um, it's actually a world premiere today because it hasn't been online yet. Yay! Um, where is it? Ah, sorry. My bad. Sorry. The Stasi compared to Google or Facebook were amateurs. The Stasi actually had to use people to spy on you. Mass surveillance is the subjection of a population or significant component of a group to indiscriminate monitoring. It involves a systematic interference with people's right to privacy. Our privacy is a uh, human right. Why well, know we're feeding the beast? Some of the scariest forms of censorship come from surveillance, and that's self-censorship. 
Alle entwickelten Demokratien haben so eine Art Konzept von Verhältnismäßigkeit. Um, it's not a conspiracy theory. You don't need conspiracies when you have the simplicity of business models. The system in one way is set up for them to make money and sell our little bits of data. Those different pieces of metadata can be linked together to profile someone and how their behavior is. Um, and that's what's threatening about it. If everything is public, if the norm is public, then anything that you want to keep to yourself has an association of guilt attached to it. The companies and the government want us to believe there is no alternative. Yes, there's a lot of money on the other side. Yes, there's a lot of power on the other side. But revolutions were never created when money or power were not on the other side. Wie kommt es denn, dass diese Massenüberwachungsprogramme jahrelang geheim gehalten wurden, wenn sie angeblich so sinnvoll und effektiv sind? Why, why is the reaction to doubt it rather than to assume that it's true and act accordingly? The actual cost of that is our human rights in the long term is possibly democracy. Ich hatte diese Debatte Sicherheit versus Freiheit von Popanz. Diese Werte stehen sich nicht gegenüber. Be more than happy if people come up to you and 
like start conversation on the project and stuff. Okay. Well then, thanks a lot again to Theresia.